Brilliant. Well, welcome everyone to the FarmStock Futures webinar. This is our first one and we hope you'll find it greatly beneficial. Obviously, tonight's topic is mental health and health and safety, such important things in the rural sector. Um, I'm Nick Mullins, Chartered Surveyor based in Cumbria, and I'm the chairman of these uh, webinars and part of the FarmStock Futures Committee, which is here to share ideas to listen and learn for the next generation of farmers. Um, do ask your questions throughout, but we'll be asking, mm -hmm. answering them at the end of each talk. Um, first up, we've got Lauren from the RABI and then Simon Ewing from AW Safety. Um, without taking any more time, Lauren, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. And yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to talk this evening. Um, so I'm going to go through a little bit around mental health in farming and what has been going on in the farming community at the moment, and also how we support uh, farming people as a charity. So I'm Lauren Codlin and I'm the Northwest Regional Manager for RABI. And I cover the area that's in red. So that's Cumbria, Lancashire, Cheshire, Merseyside, Greater Manchester, and South and West Yorkshire. So it keeps me very busy and very very much on my toes and I've been with RABI two years now so despite what this picture says I'm not from farming stock the only experience of farming that I have is I lived and grew up in Blackpool so I worked for many young farmers AGMs so as you can imagine the experience I have from farming now very different to what I have um, in, had in the past. I've been in the charity sector 10 years and I absolutely love doing what I do. It's what gets me out of bed in the morning. And I've also received support from um, charities in myself. So that's why I want to give back to help other people. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, there, here's a variety of photographs of myself. So is anybody going to be brave enough to tell me what the um, the similarity is between all of these pictures, if anybody wants to shout out? Or You're just have it. a think to yourself. Um, I am in it, that. correct. Yeah, that, <laughs> that, I am in all of them. Well done. Anybody else got want to have a guess? Look happy. Okay, yes, I will take that answer. So. All of these pictures were all taken around about a month before each different times of my life where I was diagnosed with either depression or a nervous breakdown. So I wanted to kind of input this to show you that actually on the surface, it's really difficult to tell sometimes when somebody is struggling. Often when we're going through things like that ourselves, we mask it. Um, we put on a brave face and we continue doing what we have to do to make sure things are done and things are OK. So it's also to show you that, you know, it's OK to ask for help. I've been an ask for help in lots of different scenarios. And I want to encourage anybody that is struggling or knows somebody that's struggling to reach out and ask for support. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm just going to ask you a question now. If you want to just jot down what you think mental health is, um, and then I will talk you through just two definitions of what is defined as mental health. So I'll just give you a couple of seconds just to write down what you think mental health is. OK, so I can see some people have stopped scribbling. So the first definition is from the dictionary, and that says a person's condition with regard to their physiological, psychological and emotional well-being. And the second one comes from the World Health Organization, and that defines mental health as mental health is a state of mental well-being that enables a person to cope with the stresses of life, realize their ability, learn well and work well and contribute to their community. So somebody with ill mental health, and that can be lots of different things, depression, anxiety, stress, actual mental health disorders such as schizophrenia, bipolar, all those different things, is the inability to cope with stress of life or realize their abilities or not contributing to their community. And what that looks like for everybody is completely different. Next slide, please. So does anybody know what the Big Farming Survey is? Just shout out a yes if you have heard of us and what it is. No, it is always the one where we get radio silence. 
So in 2020, our ABI commissioned the Big Farming Survey. We looked at what people thought were going on, was going on in farming, and actually we didn't have any hard evidence. So we commissioned this and went out to every farm across England and Wales and got 15,000 responses. And the things that came back from that has shaped how we work as a charity, but has also been used by the NFU to lobby in Parliament to try and get best, better support around mental health and all different different areas of farming and the rural community. So some things that came back from the big farming survey, and a lot of these are around mental health and linked to mental health. So the first one that came back was to say that 58% of women and farming are experiencing some kind of anxiety. Now that's a huge amount of people that are suffering with anxiety. And anxiety can look like lots of different things to different people. It can be being worried about the daily stresses. It can be worried about going outside or things that have got upcoming. And it can really have a huge impact on people's lives. An average of six factors cause stress within the farming community. Now, outside of farming, the average is only four. So on top of your normal stress factors, such as family, uh, bills, household, illness you also have things like livestock illness policy changes adverse weather um public perception and all of these things are constantly adding pressure onto people in the farming community that then means they maybe may not be able to cope with stress as easily um in the future Okay, the next one that came back was to say that 36% of people are probably or possibly depressed within the farming community. And again, that is a huge amount of people inside the farming community that are struggling with some kind of depression. And depression can look, again, different to everybody. People can find it very difficult to get out of bed. People can maybe not want to even brush their teeth when they're struggling with depression. And some people, it is low mood and um thinking about taking their own life also so depression is very very wide across the farming community and we are here to support people that are going through any kind of um, depression and stress the accident rate is 20 percent higher in farming than the all average industry now although that is not directly linked to mental health we know that if somebody has an accident or gets injured the first thing they're thinking about, and you guys will know this yourselves, is not how am I going to recover? It's how am I going to look after my farm? And the stress that that has on the farm and the family and the individual can all often be the catalyst to start them feeling stressed and anxious and often lead to things like depression as well. 52% of people experience pain and discomfort every single day. So not just once a month, not just once a week, but every single day. Now, again, with the accidents, if you're waking up every morning and the first thing you're thinking about is my back sore, my ankles hurting me, my hips bad, my shoulders hurting, automatically that is putting you in a certain state of mind and can often have real impacts on people's well mental well-being. So again, that is something that we are looking at and saying, what can we do to support people and how can we alleviate that and make sure that people are better supported in the future? Almost one in five within the farming community knows somebody who has attempted to take their own life. Now, you all might be sat here now knowing of somebody, a friend, a family member who has been in low and ill mental health and has attempted to take their own life. And that is, one in five is a huge percentage. And it not only impacts the individual themselves and their family, but also impacts the wider community as well. And people can really struggle with that when they find out that one of their family members or friends is struggling themselves. And the last one that came back is that one farmer a week completes suicide. Now, that statistic is far too high. And we saw these things and we knew that there is so much more that we as an organisation and we as a charity needed to do. So we really changed the way that we worked to help better support farming people and uh, people within the farming community. Next slide, please. 
So 2023, it was another unprecedented year in farming. It's a word that has been thrown about for the last three years since COVID happened. But we had floods, storms, frost. There was huge changes in policy, which have had a huge impact on everybody in the farming community. Harvest conditions were really challenging this year, and we saw so many people really struggling around harvest. And also we have we had avian influenza, which really devastated so many farms. And that's just four things to name a few. And things have just been so up and down over the last few years that things are really, really tough. So can you just give me a shout out if you know who RABI is? Yeah. Yeah, one or two of you. Perfect. <laughs> so um, for those of you who don't know, we are an agricultural charity and we stand for the Royal Agricultural Benevolent Institution. And for those of you who haven't heard of us, we have been around a long time, 163 years to be precise. And what we have always done is supported farming families financially. That has been our bread and butter. That's what we started when we first began. That's what we will always continue to do. Now we've expanded our services significantly since the big farming survey. I will talk about that. We have a 24 seven re referral helpline and we help support people across England and Wales. Now up in Scotland, they have their own RSABI, very, very similar to ourselves, apart from they cover the whole of Scotland. And we will support everybody within the farming community. So it's not just about the farmer or the farm worker. We look at everybody in the farming community and want to offer that support to everybody. Next slide, please. So the types of support that we offer and what can we provide to people? The first the big thing and what we've always done is financial support during hardship. Now, this can look so different to everybody and everything is done on a case by case basis. And the financial support is based around household finances. So it's not business support. We don't fund things like feed, fuel, fertilizer, but we will fund things like mortgage um, payments, uh, council tax, gas and electric, white goods, anything that will help that person live independently and live a, um, a decent lifestyle in their household. The next thing that we will offer is support applying for benefits. So any of you who have had to apply for benefits, it is a minefield, very confusing and very, very stressful as well. So people who are often are on low income or have caring roles, or maybe they are classed as medically disabled if they have an injury or an accident, then we can support them in applying for the benefits that they are correctly um, entitled to. And the first six months of last year, we were successful in receiving over £300,000 in benefits for farmers, which is just amazing. So the next thing that we'll also offer to people is upskilling farming people. Now, we work very closely with farming people, their families, and often they'll say to us, we don't know how to bring any more income into the farm. However, I might be able to go and do some sheep shearing or foot trimming, or I might be able to go and work on a HGV, or I might need to do some bookkeeping or IT. We can provide the funds to upskill those farming people to ensure that they can bring more income into the farm and also live more independently as well. So the accident and injury thing, which I talked about around the big farming survey, what we will put in place is a farm relief worker. And this is for accidents, injuries and ill health. If somebody feels they cannot work on their farm, then we will offer um, to fund somebody to work on that farm while they recover, go through treatment or go through the grieving process should they need to. Often those kind of things, again, are the catalyst to things going wrong, either with ill mental health or on the farm. So if we can alleviate that a little bit, then that's what we're here to do. So the first thing that we launched around mental health was our online talk and chat service, which is called Cooth and Quell. And that's for anybody, any age. And you can go online in real time and talk to train, trained agricultural professional counsellors about what's going on at that time and how you are feeling. On there, there's also lots of helpful activities about how to manage your stress, how to deal with issues around lambing or harvest. And there's off, there's lots and lots of different um, sheets and information on there about how to look after your own work, mental well-being. Now, that is free for anybody to use. All you need is an internet connection. 
So the next thing that we launched is a one-to-one -one counselling service. Now, this service has been huge over the last two years. And what that is, is within 24 hours of a call of a call to our uh, helpline, if somebody needs counselling, they will get a call back from a trained agricultural professional counsellor and they will receive um, a, a, an assessment at that time and then they will arrange their first appointment. And that can be face to face, via Zoom or over the phone. It's the exact same as if you would get through the NHS. However, with ours, there is not a 12 to 18 month waiting list. And last year alone, that increased by 147% in farming in the in farming community for RABI, which is, you know, a lot, a huge amount. And the more we talk about it, hopefully the more people will come out and chat. Next one, please. And the last thing that we offer is mental health first aid training. So individuals and professionals within the farming community, we can train people around how to recognize the signs, how to enter into those conversations, and also how to um, how to help that person if there is somebody struggling. So I'll talk slightly about that in a moment. Next slide, please. Oh. All right, so 2023 for RABI, we had an increased cause of 22%. We conducted more face-to-face -face visits with farming people. Our click and chat service, our mental health click and chat service rose by 30% and the mental health counselling rose by 147%. So that's just showing how much people are struggling out there and also how much the word is getting out about the amazing work that RABI can do. So this next slide is a um, a quote from somebody who, prior to receiving support from RABI, had attempted to take their own life. And this person says, I feel like a different person. I do not feel as negative, and I feel that there is light at the end of the tunnel. I have realised that life is worth living. I have been brought back from the edge. The first step is so wobbly, but if you can just take that first difficult, wobbly step, well, amazing so clearly that the for service that we're offering is really helping people that are struggling and that's what we want to do that's what we want to continue next slide please so this is a referral process 24 het 7 helpline number it's the same number no matter what service you need and um it's always answered by a human being Everything that we do is confidential. So nobody apart from our support workers knows who's going through our services. And also the referrals can come directly from the farming person or from a third party with consent. So all you need to do is if somebody is struggling that you know, tell them you know about an organization who might be able to help and ask them if they, you, they would be happy for you to pass on their details. And then you can ring us and refer a friend, a family member, somebody you know, um, if you know somebody is struggling. Next slide, please. Mental health first aid training, I briefly touched on it, but this is free for individuals. If you want to learn more about recognising signs, how to have those difficult conversations with people that you think may be struggling, and also um, what to do if somebody is struggling, then please do get in touch. We do free training courses for individuals, and we would really love as many people as possible in the farming community to get trained. Next slide, please. So last few bits, how can you help? First and foremost, take care of your own well-being. Take a second to look at look at yourself and think, how do I feel today? How am I doing? And really check in with yourself. Ask those around you how they are. As British people, we say, you're right. And we don't actually wait for somebody's response. Really ask people how they are doing. And if you think you know of somebody who may be struggling, we always have a rule of ask them twice. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Are you actually okay? And then normally people will say, you know what, actually, this is going on and I've got this going on and this is happening. And that's how we say to try and enter into those conversations. Spread the news of our ABI. If you know of somebody who thinks this information might be useful, please pass on what we do, who we are and any information you've taken away from today. 
sign up to our mental health first aid training. I cannot stress this enough. It is the most fantastic training to use as a life skill, both professionally and personally. So please do get in touch if you are interested in that. Use our click and chat service. If anybody out there is struggling or feels like they need to talk to somebody, please go online and check our service and feel free to use that whenever and however you need to. And the last one is follow us on social media. It's really great to be able to keep in touch with people. So our handles are RABI Northwest or RABI if you want to look at our national one. And that's the best way to get in touch with us. Next slide, please. So I have got any questions here, but I do actually have to shoot off. <laughs> so what I am going to say is there is a my email address is on the bottom of here. But if um, Nina, if you, if you want to circulate that to people, more than happy to do that. Please take a note of our helpline number and our website, um, which is rabi.org.uk forward slash cooth. And please do get in touch if I can help with anything, if you want to know more information, if you want to volunteer or learn more about RABI, please do get in touch. I'm more than happy to speak to any of you at any time. Brilliant. Thank you, Lauren, thank you very much indeed. And I'm conscious you need to go. So I'm sorry you're too hyped to the wire. But if anyone does have questions, then please do um, either put them in the chat, um, raise your hand later. We can take questions if you've got them for Lauren. Um, thank you. I'm, and I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to hand over to Simon from um, AW Safety. Bye. Lauren, we'll see you, you. another Bye. time. Thank you for <laughs> joining you us this evening. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> Simon, over to you. Well, thank you very much for the invite and um, also to Lauren. It was a really insightful presentation. So I'm just going to crack on. Um, basically, yeah, I'm health and safety consultant for AW Safety and work nationally. And we give consultancy services within health and safety across a wide array of services. However, with today, we're going to talk about the agricultural sector. So society that is not involved with agriculture it could be argued that there is a blase attitude of well as long as it's on the supermarkets and the shelves are stocked without any care really about the people and processes involved so as a health and safety practitioner and myself i'm from a farming family i strongly believe that even though there could be this perceived attitude we as the public still have a duty of care to appreciate those working in agriculture to ensure that the industry and the people involved thrive and do so in a safe environment and that's both physically and mentally and they're not forgotten about as a silent industry so, so. why i deliver this talk is a rounded view of health and safety and why it's important and the benefits and also what it means for the industry so these are the topics I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to start with the statistics. So the figures you can see are from the Health and Safety Executive, otherwise known as the HSE, and you can see it's from 2022 to 2023, and these are the most recent set of statistics. You'll see just in the footnote that the HSE, they kind of bundle agricultural, forestry, and fishing together um, this is due to the similarities across the sectors. So agriculture often comes out on top of industry sector fatalities and inj injuries. And at present, according to the HSC, the annual average fatality rate of this industry is 21 times as high as the average all industry rate. And as you're aware, this is down to the diverse nature of the sector you work in. So in total, there were 27 fatalities during this period, 21 were workers, and six were members of the public, including a child. And I'm sure we can all agree that one fatality is one too many, and we should all be actively engaged in bringing this number down. So I've broken it down to uh, the previous slide, thanks. Um, broken it down into the four highest areas of fatalities, with the main one being that of injured by an animal. So that could be within the confines of the farm or to a member of public who, as we know, foreseeable, foreseeably 
they're not trained in handling livestock just as yourselves. Um, but it is interesting that reading through the reports, that the majority of fatalities have occurred through livestock attacks and being crushed. Another high area, which you can see from there, is persons fatally falling from height and the reoccurring theme of repairing roofs and roof lights. Now, this could be perceived as an easy job. As we can see there, it's, it's far from it. So we see that unlike other industries, the range of fatalities creates quite a dangerous sector to work in. Um, it's interesting to know that the highest number of fatalities is the 60 plus age group. Now, it could be argued that when this group would have served their, I say, apprenticeships, that probably weren't apprenticeships, the guidance and collaborative thinking about health and safety in the workplace was most definitely not as prominent as it is today. I think it's important to note that the new younger generations, such as yourselves, you do instill and practice improved ways of working that will become second nature to both yourselves and those you are training or within your sphere of influence. And that sphere is more likely than not going to be your children or younger workers, apprentices, etc., that are coming onto your farm. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So, regardless of being employed, self-employed, you still have regulatory responsibilities. These three quoted sections are all from the Health and Safety at Works Act 1974, and this is the main piece of legislation to which health and safety is regulated. The reason I've picked these three is because they're often the ones that are contravened in the majority of legal cases. Um, now, you'll notice that all three of them say kind of the same thing of not exposing people to hazards. However, the different com difference comes when allocating that responsibility. So to break it down, number one, the employer has to ensure their responsibility, their employees' health and safety. So I'll say that again. The employee has to ensure their employees' health and safety. Number two, the employer has to ensure everyone not in their employment's health and safety. So that can be contractors, the public, children, visitors, even relief workers, and it even goes as far as trespassers. And number three, a self-employed person has to ensure everyone not in their employment's health and safety. Now, these regulations can be, and they have been applied to a multitude of scenarios and incidents. And if you want to further read, they can be found on the HSC website within the news section. Um, it's pretty easy to navigate. Just type in the HSC or HSC in court into Google and it'll bring it up. Um, but the bottom line is that if you have formally or casually entered a contract with someone or anyone has entered your premises or estate in the health and safety industry or within the legislation industry, you call it the environment, you have to assume responsibility for their health, safety, and welfare. Uh, go to the next slide, thank you. So it may seem a bit daunting, this accountability, in other words, but there are huge benefits and also the implications with not taking your responsibilities seriously. We'll start with the moral reasons. And I'd like to think that we are all as decent people. We wouldn't want someone hurting themselves whilst under our care or on our premises, be that employees, visitors, family, anyone. And it also, it can't be reasonably expected that someone comes to work to injure themselves. However, by us creating a really safe, good processed, collaborative workplace, and talk to each other about aspects, um, it can be strongly suggested um, that it becomes a happy place for persons to be part of, increase in productivity, the reputation of the farm, the business. And at the end of the day, everybody has the right to be able to return home after a day's work. Financially, we all know that a fine resulting from an incident, it could cripple a business. For example, you might have seen recently a farming business was fined £72,500 and then on top of that ordered to pay £34,500 worth of costs. Together, it's £100,000 combined 
after a walker died in a cattle incident. It's, it's a lot of money that. And the benefits of maintaining good practices can lead, say, to decreased building equipment damage loss. Like we all agree that sometimes a big bill for a machine servicing or um, building maintenance, it, it can be hard to stomach. However, the benefits of getting the required works completed, it can forgo bigger costs down the road, let alone legal action being taken should it be found that the unmaintained equipment was a contributing factor to that incident. Furthermore, if you are using unfit equipment or working in an unfit workplace, it is just making the day-to-day -day work activities harder. So it ties in with that making people, your employees, all happier at work because it's just easy because everything just works. Um, so you might be coming now a bit more conscious of the fact that everything's tying in um, for the individual aspects that we're talking about of health and safety and the mental health. And it, it all works together to form an integral part of your business. Um, I do come across the question quite often, not just in this industry, but other sectors, especially in the older demographic of, well, why do I need health and safety? It just gets in the way. I hear that quite a lot. And I'd argue that it only gets in the way if it's not being managed correctly and included in your whole business plan. Another way to look at it is, say an employee was to have a non-fatal incident at work. Uh, they would be incapacitated, unable to work, possibly for the foreseeable future. Regardless, you'll be an employee down for a period of time. So if we move that forward, and the claim was to go through, insurance premiums will most likely increase. And as said above, a fine could be issued from the HEC. And after all that, you still have to find another employee either in the short term or the long term. Now with this, this also could have associated recruitment, training, revised salary costs. However, at the end of all of this, a person is still being injured whilst under your care, and most likely from a split second, it will never happen incident. Um, now, I just want you to imagine if that happened to a member of your family, the financial costs would pale into significance if, say, the member was never to be able to walk again, they lost their hearing, or worse, they never made it past that fatal moment. Now, it's heavy going, but it's, it's really important. Um, we also mentioned insurance there. And to be honest, you're more likely to receive a visit from an insurance underwriter than the HSC. So the HSC mainly visits if there's been a focused health and safety incident. The underwriters, they'll also have their risk management services as part of their overall view of the business. So if you can demonstrate that health and safety management is being carried out, you're making a positive effort to reduce the risks, uh, you're complying with regulatory legislation, it's going to be a tick in the box and often have a positive effect on your policies. So if there are areas to get close to compliance, they can apply insurance recommendations or there are sometimes known as requirement notices. So for example, they'll look at the operations and give a report with recommended actions and timescales to rectify. Take, um, say, the electrical certificates, electrical circuits on the farm. Um, they might have noted that your electrical circuits haven't been carried out in the last five years, such as no, uh, known as the Electrical Installation Condition Report, the ICR. Now, dodgy electrics, they can lead to electrical fires and shock, which could require an insurance claim if this resulted in building contents damage, or personal injury, and as such, your policy will be tend dependent on this action being rectified. So if you're getting on board with it and you're demonstrating that you're complying, as we said before, it all, all com comes together. So I'm just going to move on to children quickly because children on farms is a massive topic and it is really big. We noted before that there was a child killed this year on the farm environment. It's it's not, not good enough, really. And the Prevention of Accidents to Children and Agriculture Regulations 1998, believe it or not, makes it illegal to allow a child under 13 to ride on or drive agricultural 
self-propelled machines, such as tractors, and certain other farm machinery. So just bear in mind when you're sharing photos, videos, all of that on public open media platforms, such as your children or young persons farming on rack farm vehicles, you are effectively putting yourself in the firing line, um, amongst other things. Um, now the HSC, they've obviously there's data that's brought all of this into into alignment, and they say that the children that fall from the doorways or the windows interfere with the controls, distract the operator, and it comes back to the saying of, "But I'll be really careful." Fortunately. Careful doesn't serve anybody or provide help if that child is injured or killed. Um, now, the HC, it keeps data of every incident so that it can provide clear and factual information. And to hit home with children on farms, it often uses this data, uh, the incident data, to start a mind of how easy it can be to cause massive upheaval. I'm just going to use an example here that they've said. It says, driven by dad. Four-year-old had been riding in the cab when her mother arrived in the field to take her home. As the girl went to join her mother, father drove off and ran her over, killing her instantly. So it's so, it's so easy to be done. Um, now I'm just going to finish with, with this. If, like, I have children myself. I know all too well that childcare arrangements, they can be difficult to organise, but however tempting it may, be, may seem, and like taking them to your line of work it isn't the solution. Like, for instance, you don't see children in other dangerous sectors such as mines or construction sites. I, I appreciate it. Um, it comes across as strong. However, it does break the law and the consequences. They can be immeasurable. So with this in mind, the HC does have a really helpful guide on how to deal with children on farms. I say deal, sounds but like manage children on farms. Um, I really st strongly advise you to down that, download that document, have a read through and apply it to your, to your business and your farm. Um, there's details for that on the final slide. But to finish off on this topic, it's about educating children as well about the hazards on the farms, effectively your home as well. Just make them aware of everything that can cause issues. And please make sure you are supervising them all the time if the need arises for them to join you out on the farm. So to finish off with the legal, uh, sorry, back one, <laughs> um, the benefits and implications is amongst what we've discussed. And one legal area that we haven't mentioned is you can still go to prison for all of this if it's um, deemed suitable for the incident outcome. For example, uh, a garden landscaper has just been handed a suspended sentence after a worker was killed when a moving circular saw kicked back into his groin when cutting wooden sleepers. Now they have quite a thorough investigation into this and they found that the equipment being used was not suitable for the task. Um, it was an angle grinder fitted with a circular saw blade, which we know by proxy means that the garden had to be removed and it wasn't suitable. The cutting had also taken place on a regular yellow skip, so it wasn't a suitable cutting platform. The workpiece, it wasn't like secure in place. Now the resulting injury, it makes me grimace a bit, but while the person was attempting to cut the sleeper, tool kicked back under power into the worker's groin, causing him to sustain a serious fatal laceration, just like that, he's dead, because it wasn't managed correctly. A 50-year-old court employer, he was now then sentenced to six months in prison, suspended for two years, and ordered to complete 200 hours of unpaid work, and then £3,500 of costs to add insult to the injury. Um, and I think the judge summed this whole incident up perfectly by saying, whatever sentence I pass will not compensate his family for their loss, and nothing can com compensate the family for their loss, and the sentence in no way indicates the value of life. Um, so we move on to general hazards. So I put up some general hazards here um, that can be found within your environment. 
and I appreciate there won't be one. There'll be ones that aren't on the list, but if you have thought of any, well, it's good because it shows that you're aware of them. Um, as mentioned earlier, like livestock, that has the most removed fatalities to its name. Therefore, in pure data sense, it's the most prevalent hazard. Um, I'm not going to pretend to know everything about livestock, as you guys are the subject matter experts here. But um, from the viewpoint of a practitioner, it's how you reduce those hazards of crushing the zoonotic diseases without impeding the operational effectiveness of your farm. Health and safety isn't there to cease operations or make it hard. It's there to hopefully make it easier for you and prolong everything. So a hazard often associated with livestock is the form of equipment use. So say, is it a purpose made or a fettled bit of kit being put together such as a crush? This is when we look at it from a health and safety point of view, is the crush free from damage? Has it been positioned in a suitable area? Uh, these are all contributing factors that can increase or decrease the risk of an incident happening. Another big hazard on the farm is vehicles and machinery and in turn the associated risks. Now, the more often than not, big heavy machinery that is used and they've got bigger and bigger over the years. And when something goes wrong with this type of stuff, it often goes really, really wrong. Um, a lot of incidents come down to poor maintenance. For example, the reversing sound is not working, the controls are not operable, lack of pre-use checks, are you checking for blockages, the PTO guards fitted correctly, the mirrors are working so you can see everything going on around you. Um, and also one that kind of goes across all hazards is that it's been inadequate planning of movement and not controlling the area in which movements will be happening. Like controlling vehicle movements, it isn't just the route you'll be taking from A to B, but it takes into consideration parking arrangements, other hazards such as is the overhead power lines, is the livestock in the way, are you going to have to be crossing highways? So you also have to ask yourself, will children likely be along the route? Now, in an ideal world, set traffic routes will be segregated from pedestrians. However, we all know due to the layout of most farms, this is often difficult to achieve. Um, and in some instances, it can be detrimental to the activity being carried out. So the way to look about it is more about communication and information. This can be achieved um, by parking vehicles in designated zones, um, only driving along designated routes on the farm, at slow speeds, so we all know allowing this allows time to make swift adjustments if there is to be something just happen out of the blue. Also, using your vehicle warning devices, got your flashing beacons and sounders uh, being used while driving. Also, not leaving keys in the vehicles. We've got to think about the trespassers and the robbers and the security as well. You don't want somebody coming on just having a free for all with your machinery. Um, Another thing to look about is if you've got delivery drivers, communicating with them and letting other people that drive onto your farm know the areas which they can only go on. So they're not just molly coddling around having a, having a fun time driving around your yard. Um, in addition, you can have well-placed and clear signage. That's an important tool to advise persons of hazards present and the rules to follow within your premises. For example, Fragile roof signage, we talked about falling from height on all sides of the building, especially with the roof lights. Now, having signage doesn't mean that you've controlled the risk of someone falling from height, but more so letting the persons know that this is a hazardous area and all controls, risk assessments, procedures should be followed if work was to be carried out in this area. It's also important to know that if you have a contractor in to complete the building or repair works on say this fragile roof, that includes gutter cleaning. For instance, you must as a duty of care, inform them of this and other hazards in the area. So there's a strong argument there to then keep a written record of the conversations, the emails, so you can prove that you've let them know about the hazards prior to their arrival, such as, look, this roof is really dodgy, crawl boards won't work for it. The terrain's on a bit of a slant, so you might need different equipment. 
Also, if they progress to carry on the works and they do it in an unsafe manner, such as they're not using the correct work at height equipment, please stop them from working is not only could cause harm to themselves and those in the vicinity, it could be your workers, your family, and but it, they could also cause extra building damage that you're going to have to put the bill for that maybe. Like if you think about it, it's your premises and livelihood, you control that area, regardless if it's your mate doing a half job, <clears throat> it's still your area that you've got to look after. Um, Simon, I'm just conscious of time, five yeah. more minutes or so. Um, I'm okay. conscious that you've got a couple more slides to go through. Yeah, I'll just quickly go through the assessing risk then. So, <clears throat> hazard is anything that, where well, you can read that, that might harm, such as electricity, that is, and the risk is the probability, <laughs> the chance of this occurring. So, on the slide, you can see a little graph of how we assess this risk. Now, right in the middle there is number five. So, we know. If you employ five or more employees, you have to write down your workings, your risk assessments, your policies, your safe systems of work. However, for the majority of you, it might be one or two on the farm. So it's all about doing it in your head. So let's say we take changing a light bulb. You're going to start to start off, right, changing light bulb, that's number one. Number two, what are the hazards? Let's see, right, is the terrain okay? We're changing light bulbs, so is there suitable lighting to complete the task if we turn off the RCD so we don't electrocute ourselves? Um, also another one, are you changing it at the end of a day where you're absolutely shattered and you just want to get the job done and get home for your, for your tea? Um, is there also somebody available there to put the ladder? Uh, or can the ladder be attached or to, to make sure that it's not being, uh, there's no movement or any other work at height equipment. So we've looked at the hazards. Next, who might be harmed and how? We all know who could be harmed. There's who's, who's doing the job. Is there going to be people wandering around? Um, could you cause building damage from, from incorrect techniques? Now, if, if that's all okay above me, you're happy to keep going. Look, right, well, could I actually change the light bulb for an LED light so I don't have to go up there as much because we know LED lights, they last a lot longer than normal bulbs. So it's thinking about everything in your head and then going right to the end, you're putting that into practice. But if it's not working, stop. Just think, right, can we do this another way? Now, you all do this assessing the risk subconsciously. It's just getting into that repetitive mindset to go through the steps. And also just take your time, don't rush things, give yourself a minute, so when you come to do the job or activity, if it seems a bit unnerving, stop and find another method. It's a lot better than breaking your leg, ending up in A&E, &E, and then everything else that comes with that. So, yeah, that, that's fine there. So um, next slide, just the public rights of way. So did a bit of looking into this, and one that caught me out is... Uh, there's certain recognised dairy breeds that you aren't allowed to have in fields containing public rights of way. Um, so going through this, there's a general guidance. So the control measures, signage doesn't absorb you of liability if an incident was, occur, was to occur. As we talked about in, right at the beginning about the um, big financial costs with a walker being crushed um, or coming into contact with livestock, it was found that the farmers knew that that was a known public right of way. They knew that those blind spots, there was lots of people that used that route. They should have had a system of work to check that that area and route was clear before moving the cattle. So along with the points that I've got there, it's just making sure that you're not impeding anybody in that right of way. You're keeping, effectively, you're keeping the high risk livestock out of the right of way and you're keeping people in the right of way. If you think about it like that. You can't put out obstructions in or anything. So if you put an electric fence on there, make sure you've got the signage up there. Once it's down, take the signage away. So then you're not confusing people. But the biggest thing is we go through the hierarchy of control in uh, health and safety. And the best way is to eliminate that hazard. 
Now, we all know that you need to use those fields for your livelihood. So you, you can't keep all livestock out of a right of way area. So it's how you manage that. So the next one down would be you keep the most dangerous livestock out of the areas with public right of way. And you as the farmers and the persons working in this industry, you know your own stock. You know which is which is best, and which is not to go into there. Um, but like I say, the best way to do it is just plan how you're going to do it. And as you said, take your time and just be happy with how you're doing everything. Um, so just for the last slide, there's some guidance up there and some um, good reading if you want some extra clarification on things. Uh, the HSE, they are really good. They've got years and years of examples and data. And at the end of the day, they are still there just trying to help you. They, 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 they want to reduce they want to reduce fatality and injuries at the end of the day. Um, Yellow Wellies is a brilliant website that's often got a lot of news. And if you want to write policies or documentation, you struggle a bit. They have loads of help on there with how to um, how to do that. But the biggest thing is you've got yourselves, speak to each other. You might have a, a colleague or a, another farm down the road that you really pally with. They might have a really good way of... Um, doing an activity that you haven't thought about. So it's just about talking to each other. And as with the mental health, you're all in it together. And well, the country wouldn't really survive, would it, if, um, <laughs> if, if, if you all went away. So if you do need some extra help and guidance, like say my name's Simon, and if you get in touch with Nina or them at H&H, &H, there's H&H &H Safety, and they'll be really good at signposting you and helping you. So. If you have any questions, I can do my best to answer them now. I'll get back to you. Brilliant, Simon. Th thank you very much indeed. Um, really helpful to see the importance of health and safety and that it's not just a, another inconvenient requirement that actually is beneficial for saving lives and everything and preventing injury. Um, in the interest of time, I will wrap up there. Just want to say thank you for those who've joined um, or who are watching the recording, um, please do get in touch with any questions you've got for either Simon or Lauren or um, more widely. Our next uh, webinar is in a couple of weeks, looking at succession planning, thinking about the future of um, your business, thinking about how you can um, plan effectively so for the next generation to take over or even plan now for... Um, the most effective ways of managing the business. So it'd be great to see you there. Do sign up through the Farmstock Futures website, which is farmstockfutures.uk. Um, and we'd love your feedback. If there are other events we could be running um, that you would find useful, then please get in touch with us. Um, on that note, I will say thank you very much to everyone who's here and um, see you in a couple of weeks for our next webinar. Thank you and goodbye.